Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon, second day of the annual meeting. The New Champions 2015, hopefully by now you're well aware of the issue briefing format. It's not a press conference. It's like a press conference, but what we do is we bring, we extract some of the finest intelligence from the meeting here down into our bunker in the media centre, and we basically grill them on in important issues and subjects. Um, this theme is financial regulation. It couldn't come at a more opportune time. We've just been listening to Premier Lee's uh, speech this morning in the opening plenary. I would also like to add a, a warm welcome to our audience watching us live on weforum.org. We will have time for questions from the audience. We'll also curate and collect questions on social media. Um, before we do that, I'm going to ask our two panelists to um, open up with a, a few remarks on this subject. Randy Randall, uh, I should say, um, I'd like to first of all ask you whether you think the regulator's toolkit is fit for purpose in the current market when it comes to helping economies such as China and Europe managing major transitions. Obviously a lot of challenges, uh, particularly in China these days, in trying to, to, to manage the transition from a, an export-oriented and investment economy to a more uh, domestically focused and consumption economy. And that's been manifest, that's, that the challenges have been manifest in a variety of ways, both economic slowdown and some of the volatility in the markets. And so um, uh, regulation and, um, uh, is very important, both public and private regulation. And I think of it in a way of um, sort of having confidence in markets, that markets are resilient, that markets uh, will function in a certain way. And if there is a problem, that there's a, uh, a well-structured way to uh, redress that problem, either through regulation or through legislation or through uh, the, the court system. That's all part of the, um, uh, the regulatory system. And when economies are in, in transition, uh, it is particularly challenging because there are whole new areas that may be emerging. Many of the discussions that I've had here have been about um, fundamental disruptions in finance. So there are a lot of areas that we really don't have a lot of experience in, whether in so-called shadow banking, whether in cyber currencies, where in P2P lending. There are whole new areas that we don't have a lot of experience in. So obviously that's, that's something that's important for all countries around the world where we haven't, uh, haven't settled those, uh, those, issues, uh, those issues yet. So just I wanted to, to focus on two, two particular points in this. One is that there are always limited resources for regulation supervision. And so it's very easy to say, well, regulation needs to do this, regulation needs to do that, and needs to do 40 or 50 different things. That's certainly true, but you have to set priorities for those because there are very limited resources that can, um, uh, can be brought to the regulatory table. You have to rely to uh, at least some extent on, uh, on market forces for uh, contract enforcement for, um, for the way markets will actually operate in, in practice. And you have to be very careful about what you try to do with respect to, to regulation. You can get distracted from the key issues, let's say in financial regulation, by rather than focusing on risk, you can end up focusing on compliance. You can set a very large number of particular things that have to be complied with. There may be sense in many of them, but sometimes what happens is that given limited supervisory resources, what you end up doing is checking the boxes off. You focus on compliance, and the institutions focus on compliance rather than thinking about the bigger picture, thinking about the true issues of risk. An example of that in the U.S. might be the so-called uh, Volcker, Volcker Rule, which uh, takes commercial banks out of certain activities, in particular out of something called proprietary trading. That has not been very well defined, so there are a series of compliance measures to determine what is and what isn't proprietary trading, or what, uh, what transactions would be considered proprietary trading, and you have to go through all of those. And so there's so many resources focused on that, the resources aren't being focused on, well, what are actually the risks that are being taken? That's really where it should be, should be focused. That's one, one issue. The second issue is unintended consequences. And so there can be very many very mo well-motivated regulations that have consequences that can actually undermine your goals. Um, a, a, an extreme example of this is the regulatory response to the Titanic disaster in 1912 where more than 800 people lost their lives as the Titanic hit an iceberg and went down into, uh, into the ocean. A response to that was an international convention of treaty at life of the sea, and uh, the view was that we needed to have lifeboats for all. Quite sensible. If there had only been more lifeboats, people's lives would have been saved. But the question was, where do you apply that, and how do you apply that? And that there can be costs associated with this. 
And so uh, actually very much like in response to the global financial crisis, there was the thought that what we would do is we would we'd set uh, the G20, an international convention, uh, would come together to use the Financial Stability Board, Basel Committee, others to come up with uh, a series of regulations. The question was, should they apply to, to all and should they apply in the same way? In the US, we applied this lifeboats to all issue to steamboats in the Great Lakes. I'm from Chicago, University of Chicago, and we're on one of the, the Great Lakes. It looks like a mini ocean. And uh, one of the steamship owners in testifying before Congress said, no, this shouldn't apply to us uh, because there are always going to be ships nearby. And when you put lifeboats onto uh, a, a ship, you put them up high, they're heavy, and potentially can make the ship unstable. In 2000, in uh, 1915, just 100 years ago, um, there was a ship that was in the Chicago River that capsized because they'd just been retrofit with these, uh, with these, or one of the contributing factors was that they'd been retrofit with these, um, these additional lifeboats, and actually more passengers lost their lives in what was called the Eastland disaster, it was the uh, Eastland uh, steamship, than in the Titanic disaster. Now that's an extreme example of unintended consequences, so in order to save lives, we ended up uh, losing more lives than in, in the Titanic, but it's something that's very important to keep in mind when it's in financial regulation, health and safety regulations, so many other areas that there can be unintended consequences and it's very important to try to think through those beforehand um, or as now like with Dodd-Frank in the US after five years of uh, the, after its passage, you should go back and do a cost benefit analysis. Are we achieving what we want to achieve? Are we having unintended consequences? For example, making markets less liquid and making then markets more volatile, which is obviously is not what anyone intended. Could you have that kind of unintended consequence? Uh, so after you pass major um, regulation, you should have a look back at some point, a review at some point, five years seems to be a reasonable, reasonable time to see, is it achieving the goals that you had wanted it to achieve, and are there better ways to achieve those, uh, those goals? Thanks. Uh, I should add, Randall is the Norman R. Bobbins Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, and I'm proud to say a member of our Global Agenda Council on the Global financial system. So he's been working with the forum on this subject for a while. Randall, if I may just stay with you, because that's a very stark example you gave us. So what, in your view, has the cost-benefit analysis been of, um, of the regulation in the US following the, the crisis? And um, what, what, if anything, needs to be done to get that balance just right? So we certainly need to do much more uh, uh, analysis of financial regulation. This is one of the things that I've been pushing for is that fifth anniversary of Dodd-Frank, what we should be doing is doing cost-benefit analysis. And I say that with any major piece of legislation, that should be part of it, or any piece of regulation, it should simply be part of, of the legislation that you gather data and then in five years you have a particular look back. And so, for example, like I had said, with respect to this particular uh, rule, the so-called Volcker rule, I think there could be some unintended consequences of that drawing supervisory resources away from the big picture risks that are being taken, as well as uh, some uh, potential unintended consequences for uh, liquidity of markets. But we don't know that for sure. We need to actually do the data analysis, and I think that's something that uh, we should be thinking about. Another issue is uh, liquidity regulation. It's crucial to have much, banks have much more liquidity than they had from before. And, uh, and so having more uh, supervisory focus on that is important. But the key is you want to be able to draw on liquidity in, in problem, uh, when a problem arises. And it's unclear the way that the, um, the regulations work in practice, whether the institutions will be able to draw on that, or whether in practice, even if the regulators say, yes, you can draw on it, will the market say, well, you should have been holding this much. You've now pierced through this, this regulatory requirement, even though the regulators say they're, they're not going to require it of you now, um, you don't have enough liquidity and so you can get into trouble. So there could be all sorts of issues like that and we just need to look at those much more, more carefully. Okay, so we haven't done the data, you know, run the data yet, but got feeling from you? We're in the, the right place or? Uh, well, I, I think it's so complex. I think in some areas we've moved in the right direction. So certainly having more capital at banks is crucial. Uh, we had very thin uh, common equity cushions before. We needed to raise those and we have raised those. Have we gotten at the exact right level? I'm not sure. That's something that we need to do more cost-benefit analysis are on. So I think we've made uh, significant progress in many areas, but uh, we may have pushed some things off into the shadows. And to keep with the Titanic analogy, when there's an iceberg, it's what you can't see that is most dangerous, what's below the water. 
And so we may have pushed th some things off and we can't see those connections yet. Let's move over to my colleague, Anders Borg. Anders, you're the chair of our Global Financial Systems Initiative, one of nine global challenges the forum is, is currently focusing its public-private you know, collaborative efforts on. Let's talk about that iceberg. What, what are the big threats underneath the, uh, underneath the water? Well, um, my perspective is based on, on the work that we're doing at, at the forum together with um, all the stakeholders in the financial sectors, the banks, um, uh, also central banks and, and regulators from, from all the major financial centers. And I, I must say that I might also have a perspective from my, my period as a finance minister in, in, in Sweden and, and for eight years being a part of the regulatory reforms that we've done in, in Europe. So I think if we take stock at the regulatory reforms, it, it's quite clear that we've made a lot of progress. As Randall mentioned, there is much higher capital requirements. I think that the global uh, uh, um, um, uh, strategically important institutions, that the main big banks have some, some, something like sevenfold their, their capital. Uh, we have much tighter uh, supervision in Europe. We have uh, the European Central Bank being responsible for the, for the, for the global sci-fis. Um, uh, uh, Fed and, and the US have done uh, substantial reforms to, to have a better supervision. Uh, the transparency of many of the derivative markets are, are, are better than, than it was. So we've done quite a lot of progress. I, I think one of the key side effects of what we're now seeing is, is that the liquidity in, in the global uh, markets are uh, more vulnerable and it might also be lower. Uh, if you go back to, to the period before the crisis, uh, all the global uh, systemically important institutions were also providing liquidity in terms of their uh, role as market makers and, and in terms of propriety trading. Uh, many people thought that this ex excess of, of liquidity contributed to the crisis because there was a lot of interconnectedness and there was a lot of risk taking that, that might have been excessive and also some, some other problems. So um, the new regulatory framework has pushed uh, uh, the market makers uh, backwards uh, and at the same time the central banks given the very low inflation have been doing a quantitative easing. So you have in one respect a lot of liquidity because with liquidity we normally mean short term uh, interest rates papers that, that are, are easily to buy and, buy and sell. But at the same time the market for all of these assets seems to be thinner than, than, than they were and there is a clear risk that the combination of thinner liquidity and increased um, correlation between the different assets and markets can drive this into excessive uh, volatility. At the same time, the, the probably most important regulatory change that we are seeing on a global scale is what is now happening in China. Uh, the opening up of, of, of the capital accounts, um, uh, the, the, the move from the government side to make the RMB, the RMB more market-based, that's a major shift. We know from history, uh, particularly as a European, that uh, countries that have opened up their capital accounts have, have often seen some volatility and some boom-bust periods. Um, so the combination of the regulatory reforms that, that might have uh, decreased liquidity and the fact that China now is taking this very uh, reasonable and very important step uh, uh, could, could in the short term uh, create some, some market turmoil. Uh, in the long run, I think we are pretty certain that uh, China is such a good large part of the world economy. This reform is necessary to get uh, financial markets in working, and, uh, working in China and being efficient, so it's necessary. But I think one should be very cautious moving forward in, in this environment because there's a lot of global tension. There is a, a, a shift downwards in liquidity. So um, uh, I understand that this has also been the signal from, from the authorities in China that, that this is their perspective. If I should add an aspect from the work that we're doing in, in World Economic Forum, it's probably the fact that when we are looking at technological disruptions in the financial sector, we are going to see a lot of transformation in over the years to come. Um, the, the work stream that we have been running together with the global, large global banks um, are basically indicating that all parts, all business units in, in a bank will be uh, 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 a part of that transition, whether we're talking of transfers, consumer credits, or, 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 or um, uh, SME lending. All of these will now change with increased competition uh, from, from digital alternatives. Uh, it's a clear risk in that environment that 
things will happen that we haven't foreseen. Uh, that's normally technological disruptions are very good. Uh, they improve productivity and make our resource allocation more efficient. But in the short run, they normally also imply that there are our regulatory structures are not up to date and that it will happen things that we haven't foreseen in, in this environment. So I think that's a very, very important uh, area to watch. At this stage, we normally pause for questions. Any, any questions from the floor? Okay, let's dive back into your, your, your statement there about regulatory structures not up to date. One of the questions we had over social media this morning was, is the regulator's toolkit fit for purpose, m bearing in mind these, these, these huge transitions? You mentioned the, uh, the capital account opening up in China, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the double whammy, if you will, of techn you know, technological disruption as well, adding further um, potential challenges to, 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 to maintaining stability. Uh, and, and Anders, perhaps, uh, we'll start with you. Well, I think there's been a big shift in the global financial community. If I go back a year, most people were discussing regulatory reforms, and some of the bankers were quite agitated in, in, in this area. Now I would argue that they are more worried about the new competitors and the new environment where we are seeing uh, some of the really big players like uh, Alipay here in China and WeBank, but also uh, um, Apple and Google and other giants going into this area. We are seeing an enormous transformation in terms of some of the, 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 the very tech-savvy startups. So um, it's very clear that the banks will be challenged, and it's very difficult to assess what this will mean for, for, for the regulatory structures. We're talking about shadow banking, where asset managers are playing a, a very different role, and that is important. But I also think that this technological transformation for the next five or, or ten years will be a very important factor. Randy, I, I very, much, very much agree uh, with, uh, with Anders on that. There are a lot of areas that, um, that are incredibly innovative and have potentially, uh, enormous, uh, potentially enormous amount of value for the economy overall, for consumers, for, for business, um, but there are always risks when there's something new. Correlations change, um, new interconnections come up, some things are hidden uh, under the sea of the, uh, uh, the iceberg. And so, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't allow for innovation. We should be trying these things because without uh, without the innovation, we're not going to be able to move ahead. And um, there's always going to be some volatility that uh, that comes with this, exactly as Andre said. If you look at the history of, uh, of emerging markets as they open up their capital accounts, there's often some volatility associated with that. But generally, in the long run, they're much better off for having opened those, uh, those accounts up. And certainly, as uh, China has uh, a, a goal of internationalizing the RENMB, that's a necessary condition. It simply won't happen. Uh, it's, it simply won't happen without developing the, the domestic markets. And so I think the, uh, I would agree that the key challenges going forward are in these new areas and in the transition from a closed, uh, closed more, more or less closed capital market to an open capital market. And do you agree with Anders's uh, uh, observation that banks are now probably more worried about technological you know, new competition than, than regulation? Uh, they're worried about both. Certainly, I, I still hear enough complaints in the U.S. Uh, about uh, the way the regulatory system is uh, is operating. That uh, uh, I, I wouldn't want to say that, that that's behind them, but I think just as laws are implemented over time, I mean Dodd Frank set into train more than 280 different rulemaking processes, many of which still haven't been completed. Part of it is just the uncertainty. Um, so they, the banks may not like the way that they have come out, but they now know how to deal with it. When you don't know how proprietary trading is going to be defined, you don't know how you're going to have to comply with it, that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of angst. Even if you don't like how it has been defined, you can at least um, uh, see it and, uh, and then deal with it. Uh, one of the great uncertainties going forward is the, the technological disruption. Although from my point of view, I actually think that many of the existing financial institutions are well poised to take advantage of uh, this because banks and financial institutions naturally get an enormous amount of information and data in. The um, new entrants don't have that advantage. The advantage they have is they don't have the burdens of regulation. Uh, and so they have a cheaper cost basis because they don't have to deal with uh, the regulations. That obviously is something that regulators have to think about because there could be interconnections and there could be uh, systemic risks that, that come up in these new areas. But the banks have all this data that come in and they have not been using it effectively. They really need to think of themselves as data analytics firms that happen to be involved in financial services rather than as banks that are gathering uh, a lot of data here and there. 
It's really got to be about the data and then think about how that can be helpful in a whole variety of ways, including financial services. Watch see with the data indeed. Um, another question that came up is, uh, and, and, and Anders, let's, uh, let's perhaps back this one back to you, because you've, you've already mentioned China. Have there been any innovations in, in, in regulation that would um, help manage any of, the, any of the turbulence you measured? Is it, one could naturally and normally expect to see when a capital account is opened up. Well, well, I actually think that there is a risk that the regulatory forms have um, created some problems here in terms of the liquidity in, in, in the global markets. Um, I think, uh, paradoxically enough, both China and, and the US are probably better suited to deal with this. The dollar is a very, very deep market and, and normally functions well. The problem is that uh, you have a huge number of smaller emerging economies with very thin uh, uh, currency markets and when they are seeing huge moves and they have a weakness of their own export sector it's quite likely that the main impact will be slower growth because the 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 the, the, the main factor is increasing cost for the consumers and, and lower living standards so um, I, I think that there is a a risk that we're going to see a, a difficult period for some of the emerging markets and I, i'm actually more worried uh, for the countries outside of a, the Asian, Southeastern, uh, Southern Asian region than, than here, because many of the emerging countries here, like talking about Bangladesh, Indonesia, or Vietnam, tend to be very good in the export sector. But if we're looking at Latin America and, and um, maybe Russia and, and some others, uh, they are very dependent on, on commodities, and we've seen a fall in the commodity prices. So I think the regulatory changes, the, the stricter regime, uh, as I think is, is it's uh, necessary, it was necessary to reform the, the, the system, but it, there is a risk that the, the lower liquidity will increase the volatility in the markets in, in, the, in the next few months. In the longer run, we're probably in a better. Uh. I think one of the, one of the keys for, um, for China is to, to really focus on robustness and resilience of markets. Obviously, we've seen that uh, the, the market infrastructure wasn't as strong and as, de as developed to be able to deal with volatility as, uh, as one might have hoped. And so there have been a lot of one-off responses, and I think it's very important for the, um, uh, for the supervisors and regulators to explain how all of these pieces now fit together to make the market more robust and resilient going forward. Uh, there's got to be sort of a, a broader explanation, a broader plan, because it's that kind of confidence that's necessary to make the markets work going forward. There will always be some sort of shock that comes in, whether it's domestic or international, and um, you have to have confidence that the markets have that, that infrastructure there. You also have to have confidence in, in how the regulators and supervisors are going to respond. And so that hasn't been very clear or transparent. An example also would be, let's say, in, um, uh, with respect to the, the recent devaluation. So, of course, you can't explain a devaluation in advance uh, because otherwise it will happen in advance. But what you, you can do is when you have the devaluation, you immediately hold the press conference. There was a delay between the, uh, the devaluation and then the press conference that the, uh, the People's Bank had. And in that interim, a lot of rumors started, uh, people uh, interpreted uh, the devaluation as being a response to much lower, um, uh, much lower growth. Um, one of the reasons that they were interpreting it that way is because there's not enough confidence in the statistics that are put out on GDP growth. And so if there were more confidence in that, people wouldn't have read as much into this. Also, if there had been the explanation right up front that this is market-oriented, this is, uh, here are the motivations for why we're doing this, and this is not part of a broader devaluation strategy, I think that would have helped to reduce a lot of the uh, uncertainty and a lot of the volatility. Waiting even just a day uh, can, uh, can allow a lot of different views to come into the market, a lot of volatility, and then it looks very defensive rather than saying, here is what we're doing, and then the discussions are based off of that rather than people coming up with their own ideas, and then it seems like you're responding to that. Time is flying, and we all have busy agendas. I just before we before we, we do finish, I, I want to monopolize your time for you know uh, one or two more minutes. Very very briefly, let's. Uh, I'm going to look forward for a year and, and, and look forward to welcoming you back. And we're talking about a similar conversation. But what would you like to have seen changed if you could if you could prioritize one action area um, over, the, over the coming 12 months to to stabilize the global financial system or the major world's major economies? 
either. I'll, I'll let you and start. as you and as well, I, I would probably uh, shift the focus towards the, the, the broader need for structural reforms, particularly here in, in China. So um, while um, uh, the opening of the capital account can can be managed in a gradual manner. Uh, it's very, very important to reinforce the structural reforms in, in other areas, and uh, the Prime Minister uh, uh, Lee were arguing this strongly today, and, and I would be in agreement with that, particularly the state-owned enterprises, particularly what was said in the third planner of using the market price as an allocator of resources in, in the whole economy. Um, there are uh, an opportunity to improve the, the, the long-term growth in that respect, and if we would have in the best of worlds, we will have a decent recovery in the U.S. with limited inflation and a good growth in, in China with, with a balanced development where, where you still grow but, but are not so dependent on, on the um, uh, investment. Uh, in that kind of world, uh, we're seeing quite a lot of progress, may, maybe with not so much volatility. I think the risk is if you slow down on the reforms and rely too much on, on short-term demand management, there is a there's much bigger risk for for market volatility. I completely agree with that, and so rather than uh, elaborate those those points, uh, Anders did a superb job of that. I'll just add the transparency issue because I think that's another way to try to reduce volatility. If you can explain what you're doing, if you can explain why you have done what you've done and what the consequences are, you explain what you are going to do, and and then respond very quickly when you do make a change. I think that is a, a key thing that can help to reduce volatility. And so improve the government statistics, improve the communication strategy. I think that will uh, go a long way for reducing volatility in the short run. And then exactly as Anders had said, it's the structural reforms to be able to focus on that as the driver of growth rather than short run demand management policies, which inherently will be much more volatile. I look forward to welcoming you back next year so we can, we can look at the progress and, and, and debate that. Randall, Anders, thank you very much both indeed. Um, thank you for our audience for joining us and thank you to our audience watching. On